Well, thank you all. Um, it's a daunting task to follow our two morning speakers. Some really wonderful uh, comments, ideas, and energy. Beyond the object, art for civic sake. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a material girl. <laughs> I love a good art object. I swoon at the sight of thick, beautifully applied paint. I love to see things that are well crafted. But that's not what I'm going to talk to you about today. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about artists that are engaging in different ways of working in the public realm, bringing what they know and how they think to some of the most important civic issues of our day. So King County began its art program in 1973. It was the first in Washington State, and it was one of the first in the country. We were followed shortly thereafter by the city of Seattle and Washington State itself. This was one of the very first projects that the King County Arts Commission undertook. In 1978, as part of a truly innovative symposium entitled Earthwork, Land Reclamation as Sculpture, a brilliant arts coordinator, Jerry Allen, invited Robert Morris and seven other internationally known artists to come to King County and to put forward proposals that were intended to create a new tool for the rehabilitation of technologically abused land. He asked artists to propose designs as reclamation projects for, for surplus gravel pits, surface mines, and landfill sites. From this innovative symposium, two projects were realized. This one here, Robert Morris's Earthworks in Kent, Washington, which is a small community south of Seattle. And this project by artist Herbert Beyer. Those of you that were in the um, presentation yesterday where I mentioned the With and Without show, and a lot of people were very interested in the With and Without show, I use this in With and Without. I don't have the without slide in this presentation, but suffice it to say, before Herbert Beyer showed up and proposed his solution, which is a gorgeous, functioning stormwater detention system and public park in Kent, Washington, it was a large, muddy pit with two giant culverts. It did control stormwater, though. <laughs> this was also the very first project for the city of Kent's newly created Arts Commission. This was a small community with an innovative mayor. Herbert Beyer's work was informed by his work with the Bajas and his strong dedication to the idea that art should have social utility. He felt strongly that his work would more fully engage the public through the fusion of art and technology. If the lay person or casual observer of art could come to appreciate a function that related to their lives, such a relationship might also encourage them to appreciate and, and possibly understand the artwork. So this was a real shift for us in thinking and ideas. The premise of the Earthwork Symposium and those two realized projects really redefined the notion of public art at a very early time of the development of the programs in our region. King County was pursuing a new type of land use policy through its Arts Commission. And it was asserting that contemporary artists can and should be instrumental in envisioning solutions for some of the most pressing and important civic issues. We heard some of that in this morning's keynote address as well. This fundamental principle that artists' ideas can shape our built environment as well as our civic life and public policy decisions continues to inform our practice even to this day. In terms of growth, the complexity and scale of this endeavor was really unique. It forced the Arts Commission to develop collaborative partnerships. Again, still a hallmark of our practice. It made them grow in extraordinary ways. This project represented a coming together of various stakeholders. It was funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. It was also the first art project funded by the US Bureau of Mines. It also forced the Arts Commission to learn the language of public works, a language we now speak fluently. 
Robert Morris, for his part, never shies away from controversy either. Yesterday, we had a little bit of a conversation about controversy. Morris asserted that he was not there as a decorator. He wasn't there to cover up the technological abuse. In fact, he left blackened stumps, a ghost forest, he called it, to remind us of the land use policies that have resulted in these sites. He refused to erase the degradation in the landscape, framing the issues still at the core of environmental interventions and reclamation placemaking. 35 years later, Robert Morris expressed his own moral dilemma at this early intersection of art and land use policy. The city of Seattle for over 20 years has been embedding artists in the departments of City Light, uh, Seattle Public Utilities, and Seattle Department of Transportation. One of the very first artists in residence with SPU was Buster Simpson. Many of you may know Buster's work. Um, he actually has completed some projects in Canada. He's one of the foremost environmental artists working in the United States. The embedded artists had the ability to influence the thinking of the agency. They were there every day. They did not come with a mandate to create a piece of art. They came with a mandate to understand the mission of the agency and to influence outcomes. That involvement with Seattle Public Utilities in those early years resulted in an art master plan called Poetic Utility that still continues to inform the intersection of artists with Seattle Public Utility projects. It also launched Buster on about a 12-year project with a consortium of designers and community members called Greening Vine Street, which is a reimagination of stormwater infiltration along Vine Street in Seattle's Belltown neighborhood. I'm currently working on large-scale green stormwater infrastructure projects, or GFIs as we call them, using the city tree lawns as a network to filter and hold stormwater. This project was light years ahead of our current commitment to that practice. Buster started with early interventions, just kind of guerrilla actions. One of them were these suitcase planters. So he reclaimed abandoned suitcases, filled them with dirt, and let the birds plant the seeds. In this picture, you see some petunias because he told me people complained about the weeds. So he figured, what could I plant? Petunias. This was a way of setting the stage for later works. The city's public works department then invested in the cistern steps, which channels stormwater. And also in the, cistern, in the large cistern you see there that's based on the beckoning hand, the hand of man in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. This was a way of expressing the connection to urban residents between their roof watershed and stormwater, and the way that we are putting massive amounts of stormwater into our sewer system. The county and the city is now undergoing a federally mandated program to change that practice. All throughout the city, we're creating combined sewer overflow projects. Again, this was a very early way of pointing towards those solutions. Buster didn't stop only with the public sector. He also involved the private sector in ways large and small. So these are private condo developments, and they range from everything from a downspout with elbows in it and soil and plants that sweetens the water before it enters uh, the ground plane, and also harvesting roof water runoff again. He created two water features for a high-end condo development. Drinking glass you see there that filters waters through a reed bed. And a, a really brilliant artwork called Water Table that is a, a passive water feature. It's activated by a storm event. It literally erupts from the table. This required developers to install many things they hadn't done before, like uh, water collection cisterns in parking garages, and really think about how to harvest, hold, and filter water in natural ways. Sarah Bergman's Pollinator Pathway proposes not a neighborhood solution, but she's interested in connecting green spaces throughout the planet to support native pollinators. I've had a couple of conversations with Sarah that have fundamentally changed my thinking. Although Sarah was awarded the Betty Bowen Award, which is a, an award by the Seattle Arts Muse 
Museum designed to highlight the achievements of emerging artists. And she was also named by Stranger Magazine as one of their genius award winners. Sarah doesn't like to use the label artist. She prefers to call herself design thinker. In explaining that to me, she told me that she felt that the term artist diminished her to others, that it rendered her into a category where she felt they didn't take her seriously or she didn't have the ability to be as effective as she knew she could be. I'm not sure I agree with Sarah, but that comment haunts me. I think about it almost daily. Have we marginalized artists? Are we marginalizing them? Or are we recognizing them as the truly innovative thinkers, reimagineers, and doers of our work? The Pollinator Pathway started actually as a small neighborhood pilot project. Well, not so small. It's a mile long. Uh, it's on, along Col Seattle's Columbia Street. Sarah worked with each individual homeowner, and there are 60 properties involved here, and she's still evolving this project. She's still working on it um, to connect all these green spaces. She began her research on plants and pollinators in 2007. She spent several years testing and vetting them against Seattle Department of Transportation guidelines and standards. And this project is a real collaborative effort between the homeowners, the artist, and the ultimate goals of the project because it, it requires buy-in from them and an adherence to the program guidelines that not only support native pollinators, and Sarah will tell you, it's not all about the bees, but it also reflects aesthetic standards that the artist is interested in promoting throughout the landscape. Sarah's now been hired by Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture to engage with Seattle City Light and she'll be happy, perhaps, with the opportunity to launch a more expansive pollinator pathway within one of the city's transmission line corridors. Sarah is contracted to do the design work, to work with Seattle City Light, to choose plantings, and to talk about their ability to plant them and maintain them. And then she's also contracted to develop community engagement and outreach events as part of this design development to explain what they're doing, to explain how pollinator pathways can help throughout the city. In 2010, King County Parks Department asked us to hire artists to activate a series of kiosks that had been donated by Starbucks and that were dotted along major intersections on a 175 mile regional trail system. Well, we agreed to do it. We weren't particularly excited about it, posters and kiosks, but we thought, you know, the parks department in King County has really been decimated by a lot of staff layoffs a lot of budget cuts, they're really reeling, they're trying to reestablish their identity and pride in their work. Let's just start small and let's build their capacity slowly. The artists, however, had another idea. They did in fact put posters in the kiosks announcing events. Those first three artists were Stokely Tolls, Susan Robb, and Paul Rucker. Stokely and Susan collaborated on a project called The Long Walk that grew into a continuing involvement with us in 2011 and 2012, with Susan spearheading the activity. The Long Walk is a time-based, open-source participatory event in which artist Susan Robb and 50 self-selecting members of the general public traverse the King County Regional Trail System. The Long Walk is a pedestrian adventure that begins on the shores of the Puget Sound in the heart of Seattle it travels through the urban core. It travels across the east side to the suburbs, into the rural farmlands, through protected forests, and it ends here at Snoqualmie Falls. You can get there from here, though there's no going home. Everywhere you go will be somewhere you've never been. Try this. Head south on Mississippi 49, one by one mile markers ticking off another minute of your life. Follow this to its natural conclusion. Dead end at the coast, the pier at Gulfport, where riggings of shrimp boats are loose stitches in a sky threatening rain. Cross over the man-made beach, 26 miles of sand dumped on a mangrove swamp. 
buried terrain of the past. Bring only what you must carry, tome of memory, its random blank pages. On the dock where you board the boat for Ship Island, someone will take your picture. The photograph, who you were, will be waiting when you return. So participants experience a true shift in their sense of time, a new understanding of local geography, and the creation of an interstitial culture. Curated events, invited artists, and interactive activities help spur collective experiences and alter the social terrain. The Long Walk offers us an opportunity to slow down and delve deep into the meaning of landscape, home, and place. This artistic occupation of public space connects trail users and trailside communities through creative engagement. From my perspective, it also offered me an extraordinary additional opportunity. My county, King County, is the home of Seattle, 39 other cities, and rural lands and protected forests. This project, like no other that we've done before, really connected urban livers to rural lands. Though, if for exa one example is at Oxbow Farms. The long walkers were invited to harvest produce and then write love poems to include in the packages that were then sent into the city and sold at the Ballard Farmer's Market. The Long Walk created a community of trail ambassadors. This surprised all of us. The 150 plus walkers are artists, writers, poets, citizen activists, and business entrepreneurs. They're bus drivers and park rangers, nurses, school teachers, and designers. And they wrote and blogged and created amazing testimonials about their transformative experience and the wonder that is readily available as King County Parks describes it in your big backyard. This was an amazing growth opportunity for County Parks. People walked 50 miles on a trail. They started in the city and they ended at Snoqualmie Falls. They camped in places that are not open before to campers. It required an extraordinary effort and a leap of faith on the part of our partner. But what they were left with was a capacity to push at the boundaries and their assumptions about what art can be or should do. And these temporary innovative interventions by artists in King County Parks have really bolstered their confidence and their interest in commissioning future projects for parks, trails, and open spaces. They, they were a client that was afraid and they are now one of our boldest participants. One of the things that we are always looking at is how to nurture our local arts population. We have a wonderful community of graphic novelists, comic book artists, animators, and filmmakers. So one of the ways that we've been co connecting to these artists is to use their skills as storytellers and to link that to our outreach efforts. Artists are really great at explaining complex issues and, and they do it in a really compelling and accessible way. So one of the projects that we scoped recently was a hazmat PSA, public service announcement. We hired two artists, and you see them there, Clyde Peterson in the lower, I believe it, well, it might be right-hand side of your screen, and in the middle with the blue hair, Edie Everett. So Clyde is a filmmaker. He did a wonderful animated film about the um, continuing lingering pesticides in the environment. And Edie did a comic book. I'm not going to show you Clyde's film today. I don't have time, but I'm going to show you Edie's, uh, one page of Edie's comic book, which is called has matters. So uh, Edie created this cast of characters that you see there, each of them with their own rationale for why they were going to dispose of their household chemical waste in the proper way. One was to get a girlfriend. 
One was to impress his mother. Um, and she told these wonderful stories throughout the book. There's also recipes for making your own home non-toxic cleaning products. There's recipes for cookies. There's little stories and vignettes. There's information told in pictures about where you can take household hazardous waste. We printed these comic books in both English and Spanish, and they're really designed as an activity for kids and adults to do together so that they can share that information. So all of our drinking water in this area, for the most part, comes from the mountains, way up in the Cascades. All of this water, of course, falls downhill into tributaries, which take it onto greater, larger tributaries, which you know, sometimes are collected in reservoirs. So this is where our drinking water comes from, the mountains. It gets piped. Through pipes. Pipelines. Through pipelines. There's literally miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of piping. It's all connected, moving water for us that we don't ever think about. Through pipes to our home where we live. You turn on the faucet, you have fresh water, right? I use water to take baths, flush the toilet, cook, clean, uh, clean ourselves, uh, to water our gardens. Washing myself and my dishes and my laundry. Cook with it, drink it. How many gallons of water do you think each person uses per day? That's a brief excerpt of Tess Martin's extraordinary film. The artist animated that entire film using only water and India ink. Um, it's a film that's about, uh, in its entirety, about six minutes long. It's shown on public television. It's shown at the Brightwater Education Center. It was part of our Bright Reach, uh, Brightwater Outreach projects. It's also been shown at international children's film festivals. And it is now part of the toolkit that wastewater treatment engineers and scientists use in talking with community groups and school kids. We also have hired performing artists. Stokely Tolls, again, as part of our Bright Water Outreach strategies, developed two one-person, 50-minute monologue shows. These shows are both hilarious and factual. One is called Flushed into the World of Wastewater Treatment, What Happens When We Flush, and the other is called Life in the Gutter. For both of these projects, Stokely actually shadowed Public Works staff. He went into the gutters. Um, he followed the um, complete line of wastewater treatment from table to toilet to treatment facility to biosolids out to the wheat fields in eastern Washington and back to the table again. Um, we have used Stokely's performance in education settings and outreach activities as part of events and festivals. The city of Seattle used Life in the Gutter as part of their open public meetings and open houses when they were explaining to, the, to members of the general public, community members, neighborhood members, um, what was coming in terms of developments of some of their CSO and wastewater treatment facilities. I love this project, even though it's, we didn't produce it in King County. Um, it was produced by LA Commons and the Los Angeles Arts Commission with artist Rostin Wu, but uh, Rostin actually um, began his formative years in our region. It's an extraordinary project that shows how artists can really intersect with big planning activities. Um, in, this, in this case, a neighborhood in Los Angeles. Willowbrook is an unincorporated residential area in between Watts and Compton. It's an area that's receiving a lot of investment from the county. The LA County Arts Commission asked me to create an artwork that would connect residents with the people in charge of all that planning. When people think of the area, they often see a place defined by what it lacks or by its problems. But we wanted planners to be able to see Willowbrook in a much richer way. The Arts Commission had already worked with LA Commons to map Willowbrook's cultural institutions, 
but I wanted to find out how residents incorporated creativity in their everyday lives. I used billboards, text messages, and surveys, and I went door to door working with residents to discover and document what they loved about their neighborhood. I made a book of photographs and stories showing Willowbrook residents with their homes, gardens, and vehicles. I presented this all back to the community in a photo exhibition and festival created entirely from residents' own work. In this area of the community, it has a bad reputation. We need to see this kind of stuff on the news. You know, let's see the good stuff on the news. I love that project because it really kind of turns the planning around in a way that speaks to me. Often, I'm asked to come into communities where there's kind of a top-down planning activity going on. We're going to build something, and we're asking people how they can accept it, rather than looking at who are these people and how can we integrate our project into what's happening in their communities. The last project I'm going to talk to you about is one of our newest. It was envisioned by an extraordinary public art coordinator, Jordan Howland, at Fort Culture. In cooperation with the county's juvenile court, prosecuting attorney's office, and Department of Adult and Juvenile Detention, Fort Culture developed creative justice. This is an arts-based alternative to incarceration for youth in King County. Through collaboration with mentor artists, Participants are considering the root causes of incarceration as they intersect with racism, classism, and other oppressions, and they're focusing on the positive role youth voice can have in building a more equitable just system, justice system for our region. The pilot year of programming, which is underway right now, it began last February, will, inc will um, engage 48 youth and their families. These are all court-involved youth. So the goals of the creative uh, justice program you see there on the screen, lifting up creativity and strengthening participants' protective factors, helping to decrease their risk factors, supporting the county's broader efforts to reduce reliance on youth incarceration, helping to eliminate racial disproportionality, which affects King County and many areas in the United States, and to provide avenues for youth to express and adults to support the transformation. Youth deemed moderate or high risk through the court's risk assessment process can participate in the pilot sessions. Judges, attorneys, probation counselors, and youth advocates make the referrals. But joining the program is completely elective. The youth are not forced to participate, it's not mandatory, and no one is penalized for non-participation. The prosecuting attorney's office is considering involvement in creative justice at, as mitigation in any case and incentive for terminating probation early. In fact, we've already seen several cases dismissed and two felonies downgraded to misdemeanors as a result of creative justice. So what does participation look like? Well, mentor artists lead eight to 10 week sessions, intensive project sessions in a range of disciplines. During the sessions, the participants meet twice a week for two hours to dialogue, create, and share a meal. Supplementary monthly leadership gatherings offer deeper engagement opportunities and a way for them to stay connected and involved with the program when their session ends. Project sessions include various artistic skill buildings, but there's always an emphasis on social practice, discussion and learning about the principles of anti-racism. Partner sites throughout the county host these sessions, and that was intentional. We are, not creating, we are not offering creative justice sessions at the youth detention facility. We're offering them out into the community so that they really develop those strong community connections between the youth and the host venues. In exchange for their creative work, youth receive community service credit and stipends. They get $40 a week which helps incentivize their participation and helps pay their court fines and other related expenses. And at the end of each session, the youth collaborate to, to produce some kind of a community event or action. They invite their families and their friends, and families are encouraged to engage in various ways. 
As we all know I, from our, the work that we do, the arts can really build essential skills and behaviors. And they're listed there on the screen, some of them. But creative justice also provides an opportunity for court-involved youth to develop all of these skills and to serve as a vehicle for youth to demonstrate alternative pathways toward individual and community healing. The success of this program is completely dependent on the artists, on our artists that are involved in it. Our lead engagement artist is Aaron Counts. He's a Seattle-based writer, educator, and counselor. He was selected as the lead engagement artist, which means he oversees the implementation of programming and serves as a liaison to the mentor artists and the courts. Aaron really understands the transformative power of art. He's written and read with professors and prisoners, dropouts and scholars. He's an active artist in residence with Seattle Arts and Lectures, writers in the school program, and he's the co-author of a nonfiction text, Reclaiming Black Manhood. He's a longtime lecturer on the subject of race and social justice. Aaron also received his MFA from the University of British Columbia, but he currently lives in Seattle in the Central District, which is the neighborhood which houses the Children and Family Justice Center. Shantina Vernon is a powerful performer. She's a writer, musician, playwright, and teaching artist. Her passion is making interdisciplinary performance pieces that fuse live music, poetic narrative, multimedia to tell the diverse stories of underrepresented communities. In Shantina's sessions, youth participants explored the power of personal storytelling through theater, music, media, and creative writing. And they considered themes of social justice, community authenticity, and freedom of choice. Otiano Terry also is one of the most extraordinary performers and young voices that I've heard. He's a singer-songwriter with roots in soul, hip-hop, and jazz. He's a producer, a teaching artist, and a youth organizer. He believes that music strongly influences the minds of young people and uses his art to inspire positivity, self-confidence, discipline, and healing. He's also been involved as an, as an activist. He is part of Youth Undoing Institutional Racism, YUIR, and they've been participating as stakeholders in the development of the new Justice Center and the prison industrial complex, ending the prison industrial complex epic. In, in Otiano's sessions, participants discovered the history of music in America and their own creative voice through instrumentation, vocalization, and writing. And they worked with the other participants to produce a mixtape and share their voice. Damon Arundel is a poet, performer, and teaching artist. He's an adjunct faculty member at Seattle University and Cornish College of the Arts. He's also part of Freehold Theater, and he has worked in residence at the Monroe Correctional Complex, an adult detention center. In the sessions led by Damon, participants were encouraged to be inspired by the art around them, to redefine what art is what beauty is and what strength is through creative writing and spoken word. And finally, Nikita Oliver, who is a spoken word artist, a champion slam poet, a teaching artist, a graduate student, and she's pursuing concurrent degrees in the School of Law and the College of Education at the University of Washington. As a teacher, she works with young people, helping them to develop creative skills and tell their stories and speak truth to power. As a student of the law, she has the capacity to teach youth about their rights and how to advocate for their communities. In Nikita's session, they explore the power of, of art as the power of our own voice. I can't show you the faces of our participants out of respect for their privacy, but I can share their voice. So this is, this is from session one with Shantina Vernon. Um, and these are the participants, uh, Fly So High. Trying to chase some fingers to my innards. I need some chicken cause I keep eating 
collar games and my mama tripping. Just to get in the two six, trying to get rich. Looking up high, but I'm stuck in the pit. Mama throwing up a fit, watch me catch it. Whispers in the ear, snakes talking. I'm good at my art. I was supposed to play ball, go to college and all, but the fast money got to me. I had to make sure my family eat. Stand tall, never fall. Yeah, they say life is hard, they struggle. You can't find really all the kids. I put myself in the easy path. So get down, I have no stress to make it last. I believe life's a dream and my dreams are reality. Together we can get there Baby, if we try We fly Elevated living Floating on the fresh air Making opportunities, I'm taking their reality, embracing it, boom, boom, put some bass in it. Bubble on the track, listen quick, speak fast. First and never last, living in the present, not your past. Uh, catch me mobbing thick with my clique. Never really had a father in the picture, didn't click. Let me kick a couple raps, underrated in the streets. RIPJ Stunner and RIPT Stunner. Walking in aggression, pain and depression. Only one question, why? I swear every day I try to make this world a better place. Contemplate the consequences for your mind and heaven's sake. But I see your heart filled up with hate. And if you ask me, that's a sick betrayal. Sky, so high. So high. Yeah. I can lift you up. Together we can get there. And then from Otiano Terry's session, Day by Day. Brothers getting shot, sisters getting weaker. Mama kind much, cause the kids always deceive her. Little did she know that her son is in the game. His father wasn't there to show him the right way. She never would have thought. Shot. All he looking for is so he can pop one back. All he wanted was the money, it's whatever you have. And now you running and ducking. And after your homies got caught, no snitching. But now your boys at your spot. Gang, give him the gun, now he yelling out bang. Hey, your bro got shot, now he losing his brain. The pain gon' change, the bullets always rain. Shit went wrong, now you ain't got no game. You was the main plan. Yes, we can, and if you do fall back, you gotta get up again. And if you do fall back, you gotta get up again.
So um, when I was asked to make this presentation, I told one of my colleagues at work, Tamar, oh, I've been asked to give a keynote presentation at Creative City Network. And she said, wow, that's cool. What do you want to say? Well, here's what I want to say. And as it turns out, I want to say many of the same things that Simon Bro, Simon Bro said this morning, although I doubt if I'll say them as eloquently, and I certainly don't have that beautiful accent. I want to say that artists are more than object makers, that their perspectives, ideas, and abilities to question, explore, and reimagine the world have tremendous value and transformative power. I want to say that artists are at the core of any public art program, and getting the best value for the public demands that art agencies become better advocates for artists' ideas, and that we must develop programming platforms that support artists' initiatives. I want to say that we do not have to be constrained by preconceived or limited notions of what public art is or can do. I want to say that our partnerships with artists can build deep community connections and stimulate actions that help individuals reimagine their place within a larger social and ecological network. I want to say that we can confront inequalities in our world and that we can support artist interventions and actions that will lead to profound changes. And I want to close by reiterating what the earlier keynote speaker, Simone Brawl, said this morning. Let's invite artists to the tables where the biggest global issues are being discussed. Thank you.